Come on, everybody, let's go. Come on, come on, let's go. Come on, everybody. Come on, in the back, let's go. Come on, come on, everybody, let's go. Come on. You call my name. tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people, his children. And so God, we praise you today for all that you have done for us, all that we know about. And God, the things that we don't have a clue that you have done, we praise you for those things. God, inhabit the praises of your children today. Shake beneath 
Are you thankful this morning that we have the ability to be washed by the blood of Jesus this morning? Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue our worship time through our offering. Uh, let's pray together. God, thank you for today. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to live and to die and to ultimately be resurrected all for us. God, we love you. We pray you bless our time together and bless this offering. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said. on this beautiful, sunny March morning. That's what I'm talking about. Tell the person beside you, you look pretty good today. Let them know right now. <laughs> well, what's going on today is this. Uh, I had a sermon I was going to preach to you about the crucifixion, the Garden of Gethsemane, all that kind of stuff, and had prepared and I'm not preaching it. You can say, that's good. That's good, Charles. Uh, reason being, well, I'm, I'm just not. Just, just not. I'm just not. All righty. So what I am doing, uh, I'm reflecting. How's that sound? Y'all know I have a habit, and it's a habit I do every month where I get out my legal pad and I write down what's going on in my life and what am I learning about life. And I've done this for the past 25 years, and so about once a month, I just write, get my pad out, what have I learned this month, this past month, and I, just, I learned about four things, what have I learned about me, what have I learned about people, what have I learned about life, and what have I learned about God. David calls that considering your days, and so many times in life, we don't consider our days, we just live our life, but the Bible wants us to take time. I don't know how often, but the Bible wants us to take time and say, okay, look at your life. What are you learning? Now, the reason you do that, Paul says in Corinthians, that's where you gain wisdom. So many people will go through events in life. You know what I'm going to say. They'll go through events in life, and when they go through it, you ask them two months later, well, what did you learn? Nothing. What? You learned Nothing. You just went one of the, through one of the most difficult times in your life. You didn't learn nothing from it. And it's like you wasted that time in life because the only time you learn things in life, you don't learn things in life through good times, right? You don't learn anything. You don't. In fact, you just forget stuff. You learn in life through difficult times. That's why Paul says in Corinthians, this hard time's coming upon you. Learn from God because he then says to Corinthians, God will bring people into your life that you can talk to and you can help them in life. How many people do you go to in life and say, I need your wisdom? 
not that many. The reason being, the majority of society, we don't take time to reflect. So what I did this morning at 8 o'clock, for 30 minutes I sat down, and from 8 to 8.30, I thought, what have I learned in the past 30 days in life? And I wrote it down. This is my reflection for the month of March and part in, in, in February. And so this is where I'm going. So I'm sorry to bore you this morning with this kind of stuff, but Lord, I never do this on Sunday morning. So I'm giving you my reflection page today. Isn't that kind of crazy? Here we go. Number one, I'm in John chapter 11. Guess where I'm going. Uh, let me tell you what's happened since, oh, mid-February to mid-March. This is what I wrote down in my, in my little thing right here. On February 21st, let me tell you about my writing. I write horrible. I mean, when I got to look at my writing, and I'm just pretty bad. I tell people I write in tongues because I really can't understand it. On February 21st, February 21st, I buried John Borgman. So when that date was, February 21st. Uh, so we had a funeral for my dear friend John Borgman. Uh, there wife is right here and children from February 21st. Uh, March 8th, Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas, 16 years old. His mom and daddy's sister is here this morning also. Uh, March 16th, Joe Daub. And so basically my past month has been burying people. A lot of real good friends. My best friend, of course, was John Borgman in, in my life. Uh, Dylan Thompson, we'll talk about Dylan in a few minutes, what I've learned from that. And then Joe Dowd was this past Friday, so I haven't had time to write on that, but I will later on. But once again, David says, consider your days you learn in life. So here's what we're going to do. Let's do this. In two of these funerals, I came out of John chapter 11. And I just want you to notice verse 21. Here's the backdrop. News has come to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. Martha called 911. Jesus didn't come, right? How many times have you called for Jesus to come to your rescue? You called 911 and Jesus didn't come. Well, that's what happened here. Uh, didn't show up. So he finally arrives and it's four days late and Lazarus is dead. So here's Mary, here's Martha. They're very disheartened. They show up and here's Jesus. Jesus shows up, and in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Now, don't miss that. Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. That's what Martha says. He then walks over, and he meets Mary. Do you want to know what Mary said? The same thing Martha said. Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Martha said it. Mary said it. And in those two funerals, for Dylan and for Job, I said this part. I said, look at those two words, Lord, if. Lord, if he would have been here, he wouldn't have died. The first time I got this truth was in 1989 when I started doing this stuff. I had to do a funeral, I'm talking about funerals, for a family. The dad lost his mind, literally, shot his two kids, shot his wife, shot himself, four caskets in the funeral home in Lexington. And they said, Charles, we want you to do the funeral. And I thought, wow. And it was during that time I started writing down what have I learned. I was writing that down, and I came across this phrase, Lord, if. And you know, I'll tell you what I got from that. I said, Lord, if. Just two little words. One of those words hurt, the other word heals. Take the word if. For many people, you have been saying in the past few days, if I could have done more, if we would have known, if we would have known about the cancer, if we would have known about all this kind of stuff, if he wouldn't have drove in the fog, or if we would have taken a different road. You can't live with if. There's nothing wrong with saying if, but know this, you cannot live with if. If looks at a past that cannot be changed. And a lot of people may be in the room this morning, you've had things happen in your life and you're saying all the time, if we hadn't have done that, if we would have done this, if, 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 well, know this, you can't live with if because if will make you bitter, right? 
So don't live with if. It goes to a past that cannot be changed. So you live with Lord. One of those words hurt. One of those words heal. Lord if. And so I, I looked at that again this week, and I came to John chapter 11, and I wrote some things down, and here's what I wrote. God does not waste anything, by no means. Um, Chloe and uh, Josh and Hampton, if y'all would stand, stand, you don't mind. This is Josh, give them a hand right there, the great, beautiful family. <laughs> Let me tell you how I came in touch with them. Y'all be seated. I led her dad to the Lord back in 19, I don't know, 91 at Denton. John Borgman and I, Eddie West, I mean, Eddie Wilson was the wildest, craziest guy in the world. I mean, he would charge hell with a water pistol. He didn't care. And when he got saved, I mean, he was a wild man for Jesus. He was a fanatic. A fanatic is someone who loves God more than you do. He didn't care. He would testify in a heartbeat. He would do this. He didn't care who was around. He was going to praise God. He just didn't care. That was Eddie. That was Eddie. Well, through that, I came into touch with this family. Eddie has since passed away. Well, I got news that Dylan, their son, he got leukemia. I got a call one day that I need to go by and see him at Chapel Hill Hospital. And I'm going to go see Dylan a few times at Chapel Hill Hospital. This one day I went there. And John showed the picture up. Yeah, that's Dylan. That one picture is when uh, they came here. And Dylan wanted to, he's already a Christian. But he wanted to get baptized. And so right there in the front of the yard, that picture on... <laughs> My left, <laughs> that's when I baptized Dylan and his mom out there in the front. And uh, that's just me praying over Dylan. Then the other picture, I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. Just keep it up there, Josh, okay? I got a call, and then they said, you need to go see Dylan. So I went about to see Dylan. And Dylan was just 13, of course, but he was so bold at 13. And so I go in the hospital room, and uh, I'm looking around. And Chloe says, okay, Dylan, Charles is here. Ask him what you want to talk to him about. Dylan said, y'all need to leave. I thought, wow, that's something. And so Dylan just told his mom and dad and his little sister, y'all need to get out of the room. I said, well, I guess y'all need to get out of the room. So they left. And I got a chair. I mean, I got on the bed there. And I sat right beside Dylan. And I said, Dylan? What's up? He said, I got a question for you. I said, yeah, man. He said, do you talk to God? I said, yeah. He says, does God talk to you? I said, yeah. He said, do me a favor right now in front of me. What is it? Ask God, why do I have cancer? Can you ask him that? And while you're asking him that, ask God, why can't he heal my body and just take away cancer from everybody right now? Can you ask him that for me, Charles, right now? I said, yeah. I'll ask him. And I bowed my head, and I grabbed Dylan's hand, and I said, Lord, here's your son, Dylan. And he wants to know some stuff that I really can't tell him that much. So, Lord... You're going to have to help me. We will have to tell Dylan something. And so I finished praying, and I talked with Dylan. I won't go into discussion. It's too long. Uh, so we talked about that. Then he started talking about wolves. And I thought, thank God, let's talk wolves. <laughs> and I said, let's get off this stuff because wolves are a whole lot easier to talk about what you're talking about. I said, I love wolves, Yes. I'm going to go get one, without a doubt. <laughs> Let's talk wolves. And he said, man, I love a wolf. I said, talk to me about wolves. Why do you love wolves? He said, man, I love wolves because they love, they're in a pack. And they're in a pack all the time. And I love a wolf pack. I said, why do you love a wolf pack? He said, they're family. In a wolf pack, they take care of each other. And I love it. And he was talking to me. And he, and he said, uh, can I tell you my favorite verse in the Bible? I said, yeah, tell me. 
I thought I was going to say John 3.16, something simple. It's in Deuteronomy. I said, Deuteronomy? I said, what are you doing in Deuteronomy? I mean, here's a 13-year-old boy said, I have my favorite verses in Deuteronomy. I'm thinking, you're in the Pentateuch. Why are you, why are you in Deuteronomy for? I said, he said, he said it's 31.16. He says, can you quote it? I said, no. I can't quote it. I don't know it. He quoted it to me. Now, it sounds like the first verse I ever memorized was Joshua 1, 9, just like it. But Deuteronomy 31, 6 is his favorite verse. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Quite a verse. He said, Charles, that's my verse. I don't understand everything, but I know God's with me. Now, y'all, this is from a 13-year-old boy who's sitting there waiting to die. He said, the only thing I have a little fear about is I don't know what's going to happen when I die. Can you help me? And I thought, man, you got some questions today, bud. <laughs> and I said, Dylan, now once again, here's where I'm going with this. We had, I had another episode in my life about 1990-some where we had a little boy at Denton Wesleyan Church. His name was Sammy. And uh, consider your days learned from life. I learned this from her. Always learn in life, right? Don't waste anything. Amen. Don't waste the crap. Sometimes life is full of crap, right? Don't waste it. Because God can do things out of crap. But sometimes we just don't look at it. Well, what did you learn? Well, it smells. Is that all you learned? There's more to learn about life than that. That's how you gain wisdom. A little boy at Denton Wesley named Sammy. Sammy was just seven. Sammy got cancer. His mom was upstairs with Sammy before he died, about a week before he died, and he looked at his mom and he says, Mom, what happens when you die? His mom panicked. His mom went into the upstairs bedroom and grabbed the porcelain sink. She told me, Charles, I grabbed the sink so hard, my knuckles turned rock white. And I said, God, my little boy wants to know what happens when he dies? He's seven years old, Sammy. And God said, tell him this. She went back in the bedroom, sat beside Sammy, and said, Sammy, remember when you were well and you could run around and play and all that kind of stuff outside? Yeah, Mom. Remember I'd call you from the door and I'd say, Sammy, come in. Supper's ready. You come in the house and eat supper, and you'd eat it. You're so hungry. Then we get done eating supper. You sit down on the recliner and watch a TV show. And before you know it, Sammy, you fell asleep. But, you, but during the night, you didn't know it. You would wake up and you would be in your bedroom. But you fell asleep in the living room. Remember that? Yeah, Mom. She says, during the night, without you knowing it, your big brother, your dad would come in the living room and pick you up and not wake you up and walk you to your bedroom and place you in your bedroom. And when you woke up, you was in your own bed. She said, Sammy, you're going to die. But when you die, your big brother Jesus is going to come down and pick you up. And when you wake up, you'll be in heaven. I told that to Dylan. And as soon as I told that to Dylan, we took that picture. He was no longer afraid of dying. He's smiling there, not because his cancer is healed. He is smiling there because of this. I don't have to fear nothing. God is with me. And you can ask this family right here. When they went out that door, he was totally devastated. And they came in, and he was a different boy. How do you learn that, man? You learn that through the hard times in life. 
And many people can learn from that boy right now. And you're facing hard times. And there's a young 13-year-old boy, Deuteronomy 31.6, who took life straight on. And he knew it's not fair, but he knew he had to do what was right. We was in there. I'm about done talking about Dylan. We was in there talking a little while more. And Dylan was tired, and so he dozed off. And when Dylan, when I would go see Dylan, every time he would doze off, I, I loved the way he went to sleep. He would always put his hand over his face like this. And I'm thinking, I need to sleep that way. And so he would do this. So he was asleep, and me and Chloe and Josh were talking. During this time we're talking, Chloe begins to cry. Dylan somehow knew it. He woke up. He woke up, and he did this. Have you been crying? I said, how do you know he's been crying? And Chloe said this, he always knows when I've been crying. I then tied it together the day before the funeral. I sit in my office. I called Chloe up, and I called, I called Josh up. And I said, tell me about this wolf stuff. Boom, 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 boom. I said, I get it. He's the alpha wolf. He's the alpha male. He views his life now. I got to protect my mom, my dad from grief, and I want them to know I'm all right and I'm the protector. And he's smiling there because he's, he's thinking this. I can protect. I got courage. I don't fear. God is with me. Where have you learned that, man? Consider your days. I'm telling you, it's a hard lesson to learn. But Lucretia and Rhonda and Nicole and the Dowd family and, and, the, and the Tom and all the family, you learn through this kind of stuff. Do we want to go through it? No. But everyone in this room will go through it. Right? It will. So when you go through it, consider my days. Uh, time is it? I'm all right. Uh, number two. Did I tell you what number one was? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. God does not waste anything. Number two. The smell of death does not bother Jesus. Verse 39. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Quite a verse. Uh, Jesus walks up. He's in the tomb for four days. Jesus says, hey, remove the stone. Martha walks up and says, listen, Jesus, you've been late already. You should have been here four days ago. And the fan was hurting already enough. Now, if you move that stone, there's going to be such a foul odor of death that will come through this valley. It will make everybody sick. So whatever you do, don't remove that stone. Because it's going to stink. He's been dead four days. His body is decaying. Don't remove the stone. Nowhere in this verse do you see Jesus say this stuff. Hey, does anybody have a surgical mask for the Son of God? It's not here. Do you know why? Because the smell of death doesn't bother Jesus. What do you mean? For some of us in the room this morning, the decay in our heart is pretty bad. And our heart at one time was so in love with Jesus, but now it's decaying and it smells and it stinks. I want you to know something. That smell doesn't bother Jesus. And Jesus still loves you. He still wants to help you. And he's still the best friend you've ever had. Number three, Before you can be unwrapped, you must first come out of the tomb. Once again, I'm reading into this. I would have thought Jesus would have said, hey, do me a favor. Um, I want Josh and I want Jim and I want Steve. If y'all would go in and get Lazarus out of the tomb. No. He said, Lazarus, come out. I, I, I would have thought Jesus would have walked in and got him himself and said, here's me and my pal Lazarus coming out of the tomb. He didn't do it. He made Lazarus walk out of the tomb. What's the point, Mose? He looked real bad. 
And here's what I wrote down this morning. Most of us are not free today because we are too concerned about looking good in front of others. Lazarus didn't look good. He came out of the tomb wrapped in burial cloths. He smelled. He stunk. Jesus didn't do it any way. And most of us in the room this morning, I mean, we're wrapped up in all kinds of stuff, but we don't want to say we need help because we want to look good in front of other people. So we'll never get free. Next thing I learned is, oh, this is my, one of my favorite points. We need help from other people, right? Verse 44, the man who had died, the man who had died, a.k.a. Lazarus, came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. It's like the mummy. You know what I'm talking about? The, the old mummy movie. Jesus said to them, hey, untie him, let him go. He can't untie himself. So untie him, let him go. My point is this. I need you and you need me and we all need God. We need each other for help. There are 27 one another's in the Bible. 27 one another's. What do you mean? Like this. Love one another. Encourage one another. Submit to one another. Uh, pray for one another. This was in here. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We're not going to do that. Uh, but there's 27 one another's in the Bible. Hardly any of them take place on Sunday morning. The closest we get to helping one another on Sunday morning it's by doing this. Oh, by the way, good morning. Good to see you. And we'll shake somebody's hand. That's the closest we get to one another's. Um, my favorite time of the year, I've told you this story, it's coming up again. The reason summer is one of my favorite times of the year, well, the reason it's not one of my favorite times of the year is flies. Flies already out. I despise flies. I can't stand flies. So that's all right. But, uh, man, I love summertime because of one thing. Don't forget that you know what I'm going to say. I love a garden tomato. Can I have an amen right there? There's nothing like a glory to God garden tomato. I believe I'll begin to salivate right now as I'm talking to you about it. So I love getting that garden tomato. And I know I had this stroke, and I can eat what I want to now, and that's great. I eat barbecue now and eat all that kind of stuff, so I'm on no diet. I eat what I want. But I love bologna. Can we have an amen in the house? <laughs> now, you got to prepare it a certain way. you got to fry it, right? you got to put it in, in and let that baby fry. Put that thing in, in the pan and get it black, right? Flip it. Smell that? That's baloney. You flip it, and you get it black again. And now you're thinking, this is going to be incredible. Look at this baloney sandwich I'm going to eat. And as, you're, and as you're pitching this, you're thinking, I'm so excited. I'm so excited, and I get so excited. And so I get my, my bunny bread out, and I get my bread out, and I, and I do this. I put my bread in the microwave and tick, hit it for about 10 seconds. I like my bread warm. And put that in there, and then I get my bologna put on there. Then I get some cheese, right? Slap it on there. Not one slice, amen, two for people who love God. Two slices of cheese on the bologna. And then we don't get any kind of mayonnaise. We get Duke's mayonnaise. Duke's mayonnaise on the bread. Boy, it's so exciting right now. I can about start jumping up and down. And then I get the old garden tomato. Oh, joy jumps in my heart. There's the bread, and there's the mayonnaise, and there's two slices of cheese, and there's the bologna that's been blackened. It's incredible. And I start cutting the tomato, and it's such a ripe, juicy tomato that juice <laughs> hits my eye. Oh, oh, yeah. And so I cannot see that well, and I'm cutting the tomato. And as I'm cutting the tomato, you know what happens? I cut my finger. Oh, and this part of the finger has now been cut. This mind says, put the knife down. Yes. Take hand, grab around finger. Got it. The mind then says, turn the torso towards the, towards the bathroom. 
Got it. The mind then says, legs, start moving. We start moving. We walk to the bathroom. The mind then says, go to the sink and turn the water on. Gotcha. And I turn the water on. And as I'm looking, it's bleeding. Every heartbeat, ba-boom, ba-boom. And the blood's coming up. And the mind says, grab it again. So I start praying. And the mind says, not time for prayer now. Get a bottle of rubbing alcohol. And the brain says, whoa. (laughs) And this part of the brain says, pour the alcohol on the finger. And this part of the brain says, don't do it, Charles. Don't do it. And I'm thinking, should I or should I not? Should I or should I not? But it's for the finger. It's for you, buddy. It's for you. It's for the finger. I got to save you. You've been cut. You need help. And so I take the bottle and I pour the alcohol on the finger. The mind then says, goes into nuclear reaction. And the mind says, take lips and blow like it's crazy. (laughs) And I'll start blowing. The whole point is this. This whole body, I mean from my toes to the top of my head, this body cares about that one little piece of the body. And Paul says again in Corinthians that we are the body of Christ. And you know what? If you hurt, we hurt. But do you know what keeps us from getting healed, from getting encouraged, from getting prayed for? Pride. The grave clothes are on, and you need help to get them off but you won't ask for help. And so you walk around the rest of the week with hurt and with regret and with shame, with all this kind of stuff. And it's all because you won't say, body of Christ, I know you love me. Can you unwrap me and pray for me? That's church, right? Because all of us at some times needs to be unwrapped. Amen? Well, what else did I write down this morning between 8 and 8.30? Uh, Oh, the next 10 seconds of your life can change your lives forever. This is a note. Now, I'm looking at for the past 30 days, okay, I heard this from John's family. I heard this from Chloe and Josh. I heard this from the Daub family. Our life was torn apart just like that. Like that. Our life was ripped to shreds. Just like that. And I'm here to tell you, in the next 10 seconds, our life can be ripped to shreds. Right? That's why the Word of God says, Behold, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. There are people today in Baptist Hospital who will never see the sun rise again, who will never see another sunset, who will never walk out of the hospital the rest of their life. They're there for their life or they're going to die today. They'll never see anything great. You got up this morning and guess what you saw? You saw the sun shining. You smelled the air. You came out and you felt the breeze. You got in your car. You came to church. You felt the wind blowing. You saw your family. You saw your loved ones. You came in the house of God and you saw people and you saw the blessings of God and you blessed so much and you got plans today. How in the world can can we not say, man, I just want to give you glory. I want to give you praise. I want to give you high honor, God. You have blessed me today. It's absolutely incredible. 
right? How can we be so nonchalant? How can we be so not caring? How can we be so dead? How can we be so blah when we know that this is an incredible time in our life? We're blessed beyond compare and the next 10 seconds of your life can change forever. What stops it, Charles? Pride. We're too full of ourselves and we don't want to look foolish in front of others. Um, I wrote this one down, but I got to think on it some, so I'm just going to say it and move on, okay? Then I'm done. Don't major on minors and minor on majors. Y'all, did y'all get that? Let me say it again. Don't major on minors and minor on majors. Some of the stuff when I get to heaven is not going to be worth a hill of beans that I got mad about. Nothing. So I want to major on the big stuff. And then the last thing, oh, Oh, God has placed people around me to help me, and I'm also here to help them, and that's why we're here. So, for the past month, that's what I wrote down, and I reflected on my life, and that's what I learned. We're not done yet, but I want you to do something. I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. All right. Very good. Now, I feel odd saying this. This is so crazy. Why should I feel odd saying this? I don't know, but I do. I want you to pray for somebody. Now, you're thinking, hmm, you have lost your mind, right? I don't know how to pray. I want to help you. Don't be afraid. Let all fear.